Uh, Grant, so um, Dr. Paul Romeliotis, thank you very much for being with me today. Uh, the first question I have was here to talk about vaccine rollout at the moment. So with all the residents in long-term care facilities uh, around the Eastern Ontario Health Unit having received their vaccines by the end of this week, um, do you intend on continuing the rollout by heading into group homes and retirement homes next, or are you going to hold it off and come back and vaccinate those staff members who are unable to get their vaccines? At this point, our directive really is to continue vaccinating first doses for all residents in long-term care and high-risk retirement homes, and then continue with retirement homes after we've done them. So that is the directive that we have at the present moment. That may change in a couple of weeks because because of limited supply. So I, I agree with the approach because this is the most vulnerable populations that we are starting to protect. Okay, and when there's more availability that comes out, then we'll be looking at going back and vaccinating the staff. Yes, yes. Uh, the Initially, the, uh, the issue was uh, that we were to go into the long-term care homes and vaccinate uh, at once the residents, the staff, and essential visitors. We started doing that, and about seven or so homes, uh, we were able to do that. But at that point in time, Pfizer announced the, uh, the stoppage of delivery of, uh, of vaccines uh, you know, this week. And so uh, we were asked to pivot and change and then just focus on uh, the residents. And so we're going to have to go back and catch up on the staff that we've missed and the visitors that we've missed. But at least we're <clears throat> moving forward with vaccinating the residents. So as you say there, obviously, that you, you agree with the current plan about trying to get the first dose to as many vulnerable people as possible. And this delay in vaccine rollout was impossible to predict uh, when we spoke a few weeks ago. We didn't know there was going to be these, these distribution issues from the, from the end of the manufacturer. But do you, do you then completely agree with the idea of vaccinate, half vaccinating as many people as possible rather than fully protecting um, less people, a bit like the, the situation we're seeing in the UK at the moment. Uh, actually, I do agree because we do know that even with a one dose, you will get some protection. Some people say up to 75, 80%. So that's better than nothing. So I'd rather have 100% of the population vaccinated, at, protected at that level, than half of the population vaccinated fully and the other half not vaccinated. So it, it is unfortunate that we have to uh, do those number crunching exercises and prioritizations, but that's the that's the, how it was. And, and as we said before, uh, the, the actual delivery or the delivery delay was really not um, uh, you know, on the table for us. We were planning on rolling out on a regular basis, presuming that we'd be receiving regular stock uh, from Pfizer. And unfortunately, there was a bit of a delay. But I'm confident that within the next couple of weeks, we're going to have ample vaccine to continue vaccinating and, 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 uh, and move on with our phased approach. Fantastic. Well, it's great to hear that there is a great element of confidence going forward in terms of the second dose. So we know the World Health Organization have come out and said that up to six weeks between those two doses is probably going to be okay. But uh, is it really worth um, taking the risk? I mean, going, going forward that is, because I know there's some people that are looking at maybe delaying it up to 12 weeks and maybe even longer than that. Is it really worth taking the risk of stepping out of the study zone that was done within the lab laboratories? Well, I want to be clear that we will not uh, extend the first to second dose for residents. We, the maximum we'll wait between the first and second dose of Pfizer is going to be 27 days. It's usually 21 days, so we'll stretch it by six days. And that's the directive that we received. For the remainder of the population that's already been vaccinated who are non-residents, we're, we're willing to go up to 41 days. Our calculations show that we'll have enough supply to do it in about 35 days in between. The studies so far that Pfizer has done only go up to about a 42-day period between the two. So I'm not comfortable in delaying further than 42 days, though. I'm sure that will be reassuring for many people to hear the fact that these delays aren't going to continue in terms of between the first and second doses. Uh, the la one of the last ones I wanted to throw you away, Dr. Paul, was um, in terms of the, the phased rollout here, I absolutely understand why the phase one, two, three, A, B, and C were set out in the way they were. But if you look through across in Ottawa and across the province, there are lots of uh, doctors and backroom staff at hospitals who have very little patient interaction, who've already received two doses. So, so what was the thinking behind this? Was there just an assumption that there was gonna be enough? And do you agree with the way in which, again, as I said, there's some people who have limited patient interaction and aren't vulnerable people at all who have received two doses already. 
I, I fully support the notion that that is not an equitable way of distributing the vaccine. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I have raised this up provincially. Um, the hospitals initially, and I do understand why, why they got the vaccine. The initial presumption was that the Pfizer vaccine was not transferable. Once you delivered it to one place, uh, you'd have to disperse it there. And so they were trying to get long-term care uh, residents to come in, uh, not residents, staff to come in. Um, and uh, unfortunately, some did not come in and they had extra vaccine. Once you open up the vial, it's good for a couple of days. So I, 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 I recognize that they were giving it there. Retrospectively, I would have uh, actually, um, you know, uh, focused on the highly vulnerable and really those with the long-term care. And so, yes, it is a bit of an equity. It's hindsight at this point, but moving forward, um, I, 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 again, I just want to go on record saying that I'm not happy with that inequity. I think that, um, for example, in our area as well, we struggle to provide our, our healthcare providers with our, our frontline healthcare providers with vaccine, while uh, others who are not front-facing have received vaccine in other regions. But again, that is, a, I think it's a function of the way that the Pfizer vaccine was thought to be initially um, delivered and, and handled. Now that it's changed, I think we have an opportunity to catch up. And so uh, we will now be distributing the vaccine. And as, I, as soon as I have more supply, we will then uh, start uh, sharing it with our healthcare providers as well. We already started sharing it with some of our hospitals, we, the ones that uh, see COVID patients, but uh, certainly not in the volumes that they require. But again, we need to look at the numbers and the numbers say that if you look at the 6,000 deaths that have occurred, close to 6,000 deaths that have occurred in Ontario, and specifically the 52 deaths that occurred in our area, I would say that over 95% of them uh, were in, in elderly individuals in congregate living settings. And so that is our priority right now. And I recognize that as we get more vaccine, we'll be able to spread it out even more, cover our, cover in a priority basis our healthcare workers working in acute care hospitals and so on, uh, community healthcare workers as per as per the protocol. And I'm anxious also to start vaccinating the elderly outside of congregate living settings because they're also highly vulnerable. Absolutely. And um, when you're saying just that, I know it's all about distribution and it's all about availability of vaccines across the various companies that are providing them. But do we have any idea right now when uh, the residents, Prescott Russell, for example, might be receiving theirs? I'm hoping the, the sooner the better. However, I do know that uh, we'll be able to have larger numbers uh, by the middle to the end of February and certainly dosages in the millions across Ontario by March. And so I'm very optimistic that uh, at least we're going to start having enough to be able to open it up to the next phase, uh, probably by March. Uh, or April, uh, but again, that that timeline depends on delivery. But on the on the flip side, on the optimistic side, it also may be very may be pushed earlier. If, for example, the two other vaccines that are being now considered by Health Canada, which is the uh, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine and the um, uh, Janssen and Janssen, the Johnson and Johnson Janssen vaccine, I'm hearing that they're imminently going to be uh, approved and will have more vaccine earlier. So I'm optimistic. Uh, worst case scenario, it's going to be in the spring. And I can tell you that I was asked this question last year, when do you think vaccine is coming? And I said, you know what, I don't think before April, May, but we got it in January. So uh, at least we're ahead of the game in that regard. We're great to hear we're ahead of the timeline. And uh, Dr. Ball, just to end, I wanted to appeal to the, uh, the biologists a little bit more in you there. Uh, as I've had a few people ask me, and I mean, I've hunted around online and there's not no real like just straight answer. So it's been niggling a few people's minds. Uh, how exactly does the vaccine work if, um, again, in a bit layman's terms, if you can catch the virus multiple times? Isn't that a little bit contradictory? I don't understand your question. In terms of the, uh, so the way the vaccine, obviously, it, it, it creates antibodies for you. Um, if you if you've caught the virus once, shouldn't your body again be processing it in the same way and developing antibodies? That that is a very good question, and I'll explain it to you in the following way. First of all, I am a mar I am a microbiologist and immunologist. Uh, I was that before a physician, so I, I understand very well the the mechanisms. I can tell you that ordinarily with viruses or any bacteria, if you get infected. Yes, you will develop what's called natural immunity that in many situations is lifelong. Certain viruses induce a lifelong immunity. Others uh, do that poorly. The family of coronaviruses are poorly 
immunogenic. In other words, they don't, they do not in general prompt the body and, and protect. And, and once you get infected by that, the um, immunity that you build up or the protection you build up likely will not last, last a lifetime, sometimes a year or two. So we know that. And so in order for you, even if you've had the virus, we will provide you the, the vaccine. So it'll boost the effect of the original infection. So that's the difference. Ordinarily, we know that I had measles as a child. Um, I'm gonna if I can be exposed to measles now, and I'm immune forever. But because the measles virus, once I get it, it actually induces lifetime protection. Whereas the coronavirus, it's a different family of viruses, which the COVID is, does not protect you once it infects you. So that's why you can get recurrent infections because the coronavirus variants, the original ones, give you the common cold. So it's not uncommon for you to get the same coronavirus every couple of years, giving you the common cold. And so this is the same property that this coronavirus has, but it is now called COVID-19 because it's mutated and so on. So that's the, that's the reason why we cannot get natural immunity with this type of virus. Wonderful, Dr. Paul, thank you very much for your time. I know you're on a busy schedule, so I appreciate you coming out and speaking to TVC22. No problem. Cheers.